and welcome to Study Topics. This week we'll be covering a difficult subject, and that's clinical syndromes. We'll be going over three clinical syndromes, central cord, brown saccard, and anterior cord. Now, what I want you to take away from this at the very start is that you need to understand the dorsal columns, cortical spinal tracts, and spinal thalamic tracts. This is going to make understanding your syndromes so much easier, and we'll talk about that as we go through this today. So first, let's take a look at central cord syndrome. Now, my first question for you is, how common is central cord syndrome? And you should know this is the most common clinical syndrome and can be very disabling, all right? This is a great exam question, so be aware of these hallmark information pieces about each of the syndromes. Next, let's talk about what is the mechanism of injury for central cord syndrome. And again, hopefully you knew it's hyperextension. So a hyperextension injury in the neck is kind of that class of mechanism. We often see it as, you know, in a vignette like an elderly patient who fell, they hit their chin, and it's caused an extension injury of the neck. Next, let's take a look at how this patient presents. Now, we should know that there is greater loss of upper extremity function compared to the lower ex extremity. This means that this patient will lose most of their activity of daily life functions. Now, the big issue with this is that elderly patients, if they do have this and they lose their upper extremity function, they lose the ability to save themselves when falling. So again, watch for questions like that in the vignette or clues or keys in the vignette. Now you may be asking yourself why is the upper extremity more affected than the lower extremity and this is one I wanted to dive into a little bit more. So if you take a look at the cortical spinal tract you'll see that we've taken that tract and moved over onto the right side of your screen. Now the most medial aspect that gets affected is the cervical spine followed by thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. So since only the central portion is affected in central cord syndrome, the upper extremity is more affected than the lower. Now there's another great way to memorize this, and that is the PT exam prep trick called MUD. So with this, we know that motor is more affected than sensory, this is the M in mute. We know that the upper extremity is more affected than the lower extremity, the U in mute, followed by distal more than proximal, and it's caused by an extension injury. Pretty helpful, right? Let's go on to brown saccard syndrome. So again, which tracks are affected in brown saccard? So first of all, we have to take a look at the dorsal columns. Now the dorsal columns works on vibration and proprioception. And in the brown saccard situation, you'll have effects ipsilaterally. Next, if we look at the cortical spinal tract, we know that this is controlling motor and it will have again an ipsilateral effect on the body. Last, if we take a look at the spinothalamic tract, we know that this controls pain and temperature, and we're going to see it contralaterally since that tract crosses. Now, I always remember the spinothalamic tract with a little bit of a trick, so I'm going to show you that here. With the spinothalamic tract, we know that it is pain and temperature, right? So if we take the P and the T in spinothalamic, that gives us a little bit of a reminder of what this tract does. Okay, let's keep going. What is the most common mechanism of injury for brown saccord syndrome? So, it's often a penetrating injury, okay? This is a traumatic neurological disorder, and it results from that compression of one side or injury to the one side. You may see this in the vignette uh, called a hemisection. So again, the most common way that you'll see this presented um, is through a knife wound. All right, let's keep going. How does the anterior syndrome occur? Well, I need you to know that this is a relatively rare injury. It most often occurs from occlusion of blood supply to the anterior cord as a result of a flexion injury. It may also occur as a result of vascular or atherosclerotic disease in the elderly. Now, let's take a little look at how it presents. So if you take a look at the image here, which tracks do you think would be affected? So it's pretty obvious to see that we're going to have both the cortical spinal and spinal thalamic tracts. So first off, we know that the dorsal columns is not affected, which means it's going to be preserved. So pain, or sorry, um, you're going to have 
pain and temperature affected when you're looking at spinal thalamic and you're going to have your cortical spinal tracts affected which is your motor and you're going to have dorsal columns which is your vibration and proprioception preserved all right now we need to take a look at what's going to be affected is it bilaterally ipsilaterally and because both sides of the cord are being affected in the cortical spinal tract and spinal thalamic tract we would know that this would give us bilateral symptoms well that's all i have for you today hopefully we simplified this difficult subject for you thanks for checking out study topics my name is caitlin founder of pt exam prep our goal is to help you prepare for your upcoming licensing exam so please subscribe to our channel to make sure you're up to date with all of our newest posts